Hi everyone, I'm Abigail, this is Megan, and welcome to another Two Kids interview. Today we are joined by award-winning author and New York Times bestseller, Tang Ha Lai. Ms. Lai's first book, Inside Out and Back Again, received a Newbery honor and is heavily influenced by her own childhood. She then wrote the books Listen Slowly, Butterfly Yellow, and then a book for younger kids, 100 Years of Happiness. Then earlier this year, a dozen years after Inside Out and Back Again, we got a sequel from Ms. Y with When Clouds Touch Us. Thank you so much for being with us today. You're quite welcome. I'm delighted to be here. You have written wonderful books in verse. Why did you choose that writing style for some of your books? All right. Well, thank you for that question. Um, Inside Out and Back Again is loosely based on my life. And uh, I myself am a, a child war refugee. And so when Inside Out opened, Ha, the main character, is in Saigon. So she doesn't know English. So what language would she be thinking in? Vietnamese. Right? And I wanted a way to convey what it is like to be inside a mind of a Vietnamese speaker and thinker. And I couldn't do it in prose. I tried, believe me. I spent 10 or 20 years just writing out long sentences and it didn't work. And I came up with this because to me, my Vietnamese, influenced by my mother, is very poetic. It um, has a natural melodic rhythm to it. So then it lends itself to this style, which is called prose poems. Why did it take you 12 years to to write the sequel to Inside Out and Back Again? Oh, because um, I had no idea I was going to write a sequel. My brain doesn't work like that. So after Inside Out and Back Again hit, um, I got a contract for two more novels. And it just took me 12 years to finish Listen Slowly and Butterfly Yellow. I am the slowest writer on earth, apparently. And then I got another contract and I thought, I know, I'll now now write a a sequel. So it's just all a matter of um, very, very, very slow writing habits is what it is. Don't worry. Sometimes when I write, I write really slow, and then I just get bored and I put it down, but never come back up. Same. I'm. I make this comic when I with my friends, and then I uh, I just write one page, only one page, and then because we keep talking and we get distracted. You know, one page is very good. Congratulations. One page is one more than what you had yesterday. So I think it's all wonderful. (laughs) How important is that when people hear the word refugee, that they are not thinking of the word refugee, but have a face, a person, a story to think about instead? You know, I don't, um, apparently I am now a representative for refugees and I'm, I'm, perfectly happy to be that. But you know, when I set out to write, I'm just telling my story. And I I am not the single refugee story out there. There are millions of refugee stories. And so I think we just have to understand that when people come to you, no matter what their label, there's a whole life behind it. There's a whole story behind it. And everybody's different. I happen to have landed in Alabama. I happen to have a really hard time in Alabama. And I happen to love my years in Vietnam. Someone else's story might be different. But I will tell you that most refugees who come here, it's just hard at first. I came here without speaking English. So then first you have to acquire the language in addition to learning how to dress and knowing what to do at school and making friends. So it is a complete shock to your system. The um, the new novel I just wrote, When Clouds Touch Us, it really, there's a whole section on the difference between refugees and immigrants. Refugees are the ones who had to flee in panic like my family did. You don't plan for it because you the war is kind of happening, but no one thinks they're going to leave. So you do just run. Whereas immigrants, they get to plan, as in they get to save money. They get to come here with a job ready. Um, so they it, it tend to, when you are an immigrant, your landing here is a little soft. Every day, refugee kids start a new school. Some already know English, many who don't. You were 10 years old when you came here, which is how old we are now. Having been in that situation yourself, what do you want kids to know about how to treat and welcome those new classmates? Oh, that's a great question. I think the first thing we have to do is just understand that we know basically nothing about the person standing in front of us, in spite of whatever that you have seen on the news and you've read in the newspapers. 
Because when I landed in Alabama, I had a lot of people come up to me and ask me questions because they just assumed they knew so much about Vietnam. Whereas in reality, you know, I didn't live inside a war. I lived inside of Vietnam. So my Vietnam was vastly different than what was going on on TV. So let's say if you're lucky enough to have a child, let's say from Afghanistan and standing in front of you one day, I wouldn't run up to that person and say things like, I know this happened in your country and I know this happened to you and this must have been so scary and this must have been so exciting because we don't know what happened. And if, especially if the person doesn't ha have an acquired English yet, we just have to be patient and wait for that person to reveal their story. And it's going to take time. And they may not want to reveal anything at first. They may just want to very peacefully eat lunch and be left alone. We don't know. Um, so there is, I think, you can be kind and also just be quiet at the same time. <laughs> um, our school was helping Vietnam build a library. Great. Good for you. Excellent. Are you sending books over or what are you doing? Um, They built one, actually. Yeah. Very they raised good. money to build. Our school librarian um, brought back some photos. They were digital, but they were still really cool. Great. Did she go there herself to set up the library? Yeah. Oh, good for her. I think that's excellent. You know, there's just so many there's just so many ways to help in Vietnam. And and if you can go there personally and meet the people, that's even better. Um, do you know if the books were in Vietnamese or in, in English or what were they doing? Um, I'm pretty sure they were in Vietnamese. Okay. Very good to introduce the kids to that. Okay, very good. There is more representation in books now than there ever has been before. You and your books are an important part of that trend. Is that something important to you? I don't. Um, it's important, but I don't focus on it as a writer. It's important to me as an activist. I have two different brains. If you bring your activist brain into your writing, for me anyway, then I would turn out prose that's actually pushing an agenda on people. And I don't think that's why people read. They read to be moved. They read to be um, entertained by a story. They read so that I can identify with a character. So when I slip on my writer's brain, I leave all that behind. I'm simply telling you a story. It just so happens I'm a, I'm Vietnamese and I know that whole background. So I write about what I know. I'm sure if I were from Poland, I would be doing a whole series on on, on Polish kids. And the, but the activist in me, I think it's great. You know, you, everyone should see something of themselves in prose. And, uh, but I also have a different thought on that. If you only read what you know, or if you only read what makes you feel comfortable, I would think that after a certain number of books where you see yourself in the on the pages, I would love to see people start to branch out. Because to me, the whole reason I read is to find out about a person completely different from myself. I already know myself. I know my culture. I don't need to read about a hundred Vietnamese. I need to read about people I don't know anything about because another author had spent a really long time putting that together and to get inside the mind of that character would be really interesting to me. So, you know, I think um, it's one thing to be comforted by the stories that are in front of you, but it's another thing to also look at novels as um, quiet um, exploratory trips. It's like you're getting to travel around the world without having to leave your house. What was your what? reaction when you got the Newbery Award? I was delighted. You know, before that, I had been writing in the dark for like 20 years. When you're a writer and you, you haven't been published yet, you actually have no idea what's going to happen to you. You just kind of go and go and go. And the stamina that it takes to keep going, um, I had other things to distract me. You know, I was teaching. I was waiting tables. I did every odd job on earth. And so when I won that award, it wasn't so much that the award was so meaningful, but what it, with the doors that opened, right? Then why am I talking to you? It's because I won some award. That's how you know about me. Why am I standing in front of a bunch of kids at schools all the time? It's because I won an award and they invite me. So in that sense, it, it validates you as a writer because I think that it's just very hard to keep writing in the dark, right? At some point, you need something to happen where you're like, okay, it's worth, um, it's worth it to keep going, all right? So what, what that award and the National Book Award did was just to tell me, you can just keep going. You can actually be, call yourself a writer. Okay. What is your process when putting a book together? Do you decide the end before the middle or do you put it together in order? 
I always know the beginning. I love beginnings and I especially love the ending. I always know the ending. My favorite two words in the English language are the end when I get to type that. But, you know, when you write a novel, it's like 300 pages at least. And there's that very long, quick sand of the middle. And you have to plunge into it and just hope you can claw your way back out. The middle is long. And if I had my way, I would just write beginnings and I would write middles and then someone else, I mean, I would write endings and someone else can fill in the middle. But that's where you spend 90% of your time is in the middle. You know, you have to keep the novel moving along. You have to get the, the, your character. You have to uh, move along the plot in a way that makes people want to turn the page. A lot goes on in the middle. And I would say that's always the hardest part. I was just talking to two other writers the other day on a panel and they too face that middle part. It's like quicksand. It's, it's, it's excruciating. <laughs> yeah, the comic I'm making right now is a detective comic. Mm -hmm. And the only problem with that is you got to start for the beginning to the end and then the middle. The middle is basically the hardest part. Nobody likes the middle. I don't yeah, know you... one author out there who says, I revel in the middle. It's not possible. Yeah, exactly. You got to lead on to the middle and you got to figure out what's going to happen. You already know what the beginning and the end is. Just what's the middle. <laughs> and then sometimes when you decide the end and the beginning, then you do something in the middle and it could completely change something in one of those places. Exactly. And, you know, and that's OK. That's like so you kind of. I don't, I'm not one of these authors who changes it, who changes her mind. I, I've never altered an ending because something happened. I always know my ending and I know my beginning. And then it, it's a slog to get through the middle. That's why I'm such a slow writer is because I have to make myself sit very still and do the middle part. We have interviewed a number of authors who have had books banned. This means in some parts of the country, kids don't have the same access to books that we have and may not be able to see people like themselves represented in books or a window into other people's lives. Can you give us your thoughts on this? I, you know, I, 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 I lived in Alabama and I lived in Texas, so I understand that point of view. I mean, I've been around people who would, let's say, favor book bans. But I've also lived in California and New York for so long that I've forgotten what it's like to think like that. So I actually, now I'm just like, why not just open up the world and let people select? No one is saying you have to read a certain book. But how wonderful to just have it available and to be so threatened by the availability, just the availability of a book, not even reading it, but to be so threatened by someone else possibly reading it uh, is incomprehensible to me. And I just find it really, really sad. Right. Um, I just think readers are, are, you know, people find their way to books the way they find their way to food. They will eat what they like and they will read what they like. They'll find their way. So I'm thinking maybe kids will just have to get savvy and librarians will have to get savvy. There's more than one way to get a book. All right. So if they ban it in one, one place, you're just going to have to somehow wiggle around and then find it in another place because the world's pretty open. It's not going to be easy, right? It would be great if you just walk into our library and the librarian hands you a book and says, oh, I think you'll love this. Here it is. So now maybe it would be the librarian. I don't know. I'm not a librarian. I'm just imagining this, a scene where you walk into the library and the librarian says, there's a book out there that you might like, but we don't have it here. If, if it interests you, do a little research and see if you can get your hands on one. You know, so then the kid is going to have to be a little more proactive. Now, is that asking too much of a child? I just think children are amazingly resilient. They'll figure it out. They will. Yeah, I I definitely agree. And we're really lucky that we love where we live, me and Megan, because we live in Illinois and there's a law not to book ban. Excellent. Good for Illinois. All the more reason to move there. You sort of talked about this earlier, about writing in the dark, how rejection is a part of most writers' stories. Can you tell us about that part of your journey? It took me so long to get established as a writer. First, I was a journalist, and then I woke up one day and decided, I'm not going to chase pop stories anymore. I'm going to sit down and craft sentences. Well, that just means you're going to be waiting tables. Nobody's going to pay you to craft sentences at first. 
but it took me like 20 years to get published. So I used to write short stories and I would send it out and I would get rejection letters. And I wrote this very convoluted, you know, mess of a first novel I sent out and got rejection letters. And then um, I once took a workshop where the instructor said, think of your rejection letters as um, as your um, uh, uh, congratulation letters. Because if you get a rejection letter, it means you're still in the game. You're still trying. So think of it that way. So just keep sending it out. And at some point, something will break um, if you keep going. Now, it's very hard to do, right? I mean, it's one thing to say, just keep going, just keep trying. But it's another thing to actually sit in that chair to actually do it. What motivates people to do it is different for everyone. But I would say, read what's out there. And if you can see yourself being an author of one of those books, then find a different twist. You can't write the same book that's already been out there. It's, it's just already out there. So you got to somehow lend your voice. But I would say that people are always looking for a new voice, right? I mean, it's, you're just always looking for that that new way to tell a story. And uh, and I would, and I know this is a fact. The United States publishes more novels than just about anywhere else on earth. There's a there's a surplus of novels. So if you're going to get published anywhere, it's going to be here. So get going. And then there's self-publishing. Okay. There's absolutely nothing wrong with getting together a group of you and your friends and self-publish your books, print out 20 copies, pass it out to each other, and then see what the reaction is. That's writing. All right. And then who knows what will happen from that? Maybe one of those 20 books would just hit really big and there'll be you live in the age of social media. Who knows what will happen on social media? And the publishing, the the um, traditional publishing houses watch social media. So they're like, oh, this book is hitting big. Why wouldn't we give them um, a contract? So everyone's watching each other. There's a, it's actually, publishing is actually more open than it's ever been. The secret is not that many people can sit very, very still for years on end to craft sentences. So if you have the ability to do that, you're already ahead of the game. What writers have had the most influence on your work? You know, right. I, you know, I went through my fiction phase when I was in college and after college. Now I'm into nonfiction because somehow it helps my brain. I listen to books now more than I read it because I have to be moving while I'm reading. Because you sit still so much as a writer. I really cannot sit anymore. So if I'm not writing, I'm moving. And when you move around, you need your audio books. And, and nonfiction just lends itself to audiobook. What advice do you have for kids who want to write? Well, oh, um, I have two advices. First, you need to read. And I don't mean, mean like a hundred books. I mean like a million. Just read. Read everything you can get your hands on. Read, 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 read. Because in that process, you will find your voice. You will find a book or two that you're like, I, I should have written this book. This is my book. And you're going to take that book, put it in your pillow, and just roll around with it. And then, um, and then put it away and then start to write your own book. But your, your brain is going to be very influenced by that one book that, that just you fell madly in love with. But don't worry, your book will be nothing like that because the process of adding your own voice into something will change it. But it gets you going. It gives you a model on what can be, right? So that's what reading does. And then how to actually get words on a page. I have figured out that for me, to sit still, to craft from the very beginning of an idea to, to when you get to type the end, it's just too much. So now in the beginning, when I'm just planning out where characters should go, what should happen with the plot, trying to talk out how my voice should be uh, for that project, I found it's easy for me to walk. And when I walk, I talk into this app called Otter, O-T-T-E-R. Otter records what you say, and then by magic, it transcribes everything you say into sentences. And all you have to do is copy those sentences, paste it into a Word file, and voila, you've got hundreds of pages to edit from. And yes, of course, you're going to throw 99% of it away, but it does give you a beginning. What it does is it prevents this blank stare at a blank page because you're moving. And when you're moving, your brain is going. And I wouldn't put any pressure on myself to write beautifully. Who's going to write beautifully in the first draft? You're just talking to yourself. You know, I have the story idea. I think my character should do this. I want this to happen. The voice should look like this. I want this action and blah, blah, blah. And then from there, but um, that's my trick for kids who have writer's block. I think writer's block just comes from fear. The fear of, of putting down something that's not perfect. Nothing is perfect. Everyone rewrites a million times. It's just it's part of the writing process. 
can you tell us about a project that you are working on now? Yes, I'm supposed to be funny. That is my new project. I've got a novel. I'm watching a lot of stand-up comedy. So let's see if I can uh, pull this off. I am looking at a character who's doing a stand-up act at her talent show at school. She's going to be 12. Uh, middle grade is where my uh, audience is. So she's around 12. And so I need to write some jokes for her. And I better get it right. Because if the book isn't funny, the whole thing falls apart. But I'm going to marry interracial uh, trauma, um, uh, generational gap, refugee parents versus children who are born here. All these issues will come up within her comedy act. And of course, you know, the, I know the beginning, I know the end. It's that horrifying middle I'm trying to fill. Finally, it's time for our Turbo Tank. <laughs> 10 rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Yes, let's go. Okay. Number one, what is your favorite phrase to use? Get going. Number two, what is one subject you'd love to learn more about? Um, trees. Number three, what is your go-to snack food? Always crackers, any kind of crackers. Number four, what was your favorite book growing up? Um, favorite book growing up in Vietnamese. My mother's been quoting um. Gil to me all my life. So then that was my favorite book just because my mother was quoting poetry to me from memory. Number five, if you could help with someone right now, where would you go? Where would I go? Oh, I think I would go to Lisbon. I have a friend who just moved there. And one day I'm going to have a month off and I'm going to go to Lisbon and we're just going to walk around for a month. Number six, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? To read people's minds. I already think I, already think I can do it. But to really do it, like where I actually can enter someone's mind and get every single little thought they've ever tried to hide from everyone else. That would be interesting. Number seven. What was your favorite cartoon as a kid? I did not watch cartoons as a kid. I was a refugee kid. We were not running around watching cartoons. I didn't watch cartoons until I came here. And who knows? I think my first cartoon was um, Robin Hood. We saw it. That's, that's like a, I don't know if that's a cartoon, but it's. You know, it's um animation. We saw it in the refugee camp, and I had no idea what it was about. I thought it was a bunch of about, about a bunch of foxes. I didn't get the plot until much later. <laughs> Number eight. Okay. What's your favorite rainy day activity? Rainy day activity. Um. Oh, I repot my plants. Number nine. If you could have any three dinner guests, who would they be? Well, my mom. And uh, my sister and my daughter. I'm very, very, very boring. Yes. <laughs> Finally, number 10. What's the best piece of advice you were ever given? Best piece of advice I was ever, ever given? This is from my mom. Be generous first. You rock the Turbo 10. That was the fastest yet. Thank you so much for doing that. And You're thank welcome. you so much for spending this time with us. You're very you. welcome. You guys are amazing and good luck on all your future projects. And I'm glad I got to join you today.